Today's Bible reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Therefore, since for God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is failed, it is failed to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, and ourselves as your servants for your Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, make his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair persecuted but not abandoned, Sh struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us the life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present, with, present us with you in his presence. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. This is the word of the Lord. I will now pass on to David, who will give us our sermon. Thank you, Elena. Good morning again, everyone. Let's pray as we come to God's word this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we love the fact that you have not left us without hope in the world, but you are a God who reveals yourself and you have revealed yourself in many and various ways in former times, but in these last days through your son, Jesus. And so today we have your word. And Father, we rejoice in the fact that through your word, you speak to us today. Father, please speak to us now through this amazing passage. Help me, Lord, to preach and proclaim your word faithfully. And may you speak to each one of us according to our individual need. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I was at Bible College, I had the privilege of being taught by someone, one of Australia's great evangelists. His name was John Chapman, or Chapo, as he was affectionately known. He had an inspiring love for the Lord and a real sense of larrikin humour to go with it. Boy, could he bring the Bible alive when he told you the gospel. He also had a lot of uh, one-liners, not jokes exactly, but memorable truths that he told with, with a sparkle in the eye. Uh, one of the truths that he told his students, as I remember it, was about Christian ministry. Uh, Christian ministry is hard, and knowing how hard it can be, he used to say to the green young students, don't worry, the first 40 years are the hardest. And then he would laugh knowingly with that sparkle in his eyes. The first 40 years are the hardest. Makes you think, doesn't it? But it didn't end there. 
When Chapo was around 70 years old, he quietly updated it. Don't worry, he began to say. The first 50 years are the hardest. And when he got to be about 80, that's right, you guessed it, it became, don't worry, the first 60 years are the hardest. It was a running joke. It had a serious point to it. Do you think Christian ministry is easy? Do you think the Christian life is easy? Think again. Much of Christian ministry is plain hard work, but it's worth it. It's worth it like parents witnessing the birth of a new child. Worth it to know that souls are being rescued from hell. Worth it to know that God is working through you to advance his kingdom. Yes, Christian ministry is hard work, but it's worth it. And if love for Jesus is your primary motive, then your joy in Jesus will always outweigh the pain. Remember that. Paul says in verse 12, these interesting words. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. And by these words, you can see the reality of Paul's great love for the people of Corinth. He loves them just like a parent loves his or her child. So Paul loves the Corinthian church. He loves God's people because he loves Jesus. And so he says, so then, death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. We're like jars of clay, cracked and broken and wearing out, but it's okay because this is how the light of the glory of God shines within us to the praise of his glorious name. And we love you with the love of Jesus so that we die, that you may live. He also says much the same thing again down in verse 15 of our passage today. He says, all this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. We suffer because we love you to the glory of God. And yes, it's hard work, but it's worth it. This is the heart of all Christian ministry. And today, Paul is going to tell us why it's worth it. Honestly, it's as if he's saying to us in our passage today, don't worry, the first 40 years are the hardest. So my first point today is about this ministry, which Paul receives from God by direct revelation of Jesus Christ. And I want you to have a look at verse one. We'll see what Paul says. Therefore, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry we do not lose heart. Now, there are three things that I want you to notice here just in this first verse alone. In my mind, I have a picture of one of those self-writing toys. You know, the ones that no matter how hard you hit them, they always bounce back up again. Well, that's a picture of the Apostle Paul in his work in, in, in Christian ministry. You, you can knock him down, but he always gets back up again. He has such great perseverance. But how does he do it? Well, these three points I want to make from verse one this morning, three points just from verse one about Paul's great perseverance. First, I want you to notice that Paul uses the phrase this ministry. He's talking about this ministry. Through God's mercy, we have this ministry. Now, what is this ministry? Well, Paul's been talking about it already to quite some degree, we saw last week. This ministry is the ministry of the new covenant, the new covenant in Christ's blood. Paul also calls it the ministry of the spirit, the ministry that brings righteousness, the ministry that gives life. This is the ministry that the apostle Paul is undertaking as apostle of Jesus. But there are some people in the church at Corinth who have begun to despise this ministry. And they've come into the church and they've begun to criticize Paul as being double-minded and unimpressive. Whereas we know that Paul's ministry is the real deal. This ministry is the gospel of God about the Lord Jesus Christ. And any other ministry, no matter how popular it may appear, is a counterfeit ministry and its message will not save. So that's my first point. This ministry is the real deal because Paul is an apostle to the Gentiles appointed by Jesus Christ and his ministry is God-given and spirit-led. And then secondly, notice this ministry is richly supplied and supported by God's mercy. This means that even when Paul faced great danger, 
he never fell into despair because God is with him and God's mercy comforts him. Paul is not only gifted with a God-given ministry, but he has the rich supply of God's mercy. And it's this mercy that gives him this inner strength, this inner spring ability to bounce back from every hit. So you have this ministry and you have this mercy. And that gets me to my third point, still in verse one. How does Paul bounce back? How does he do it? Well, according to Paul himself, it's the combination of these two things. First, the duty he has to discharge this ministry. And second, the sheer mercy of God. You put these two things together and you begin to understand how Paul is able to persevere through all these trials he faces. So let's read verse one again. What does Paul say? Therefore, since we have this, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Nothing can daunt us. Or as the old King James Version used to say, we faint not. I like that way of putting it. We faint not. All the trials and challenges that come against us, but we faint not. We do not lose heart. And today we love to talk about resilience. But resilience is mostly a skill of self-reliance, whereas it seems to me Paul is talking here about what I would call God-reliance. And I have to say, God-reliance produces a very different kind of resilience to self-reliance because it is far more humble and patient in character. Those who are self-reliant often like to boast in their own accomplishments, but not the Apostle Paul. He's only ever interested in God's accomplishments. He won't sell his own strengths. And that's precisely why he often appears weak in the eyes of some. I suppose, in a sense, they're actually right. Paul is weak in, his, in himself. But if anyone were to dismiss Paul on this feeble basis, it shows they don't really understand the first thing about Christian ministry and about the supply of God's mercy that is there for all who trust in the Lord. Yes, Christian ministry is hard work. It requires wisdom and grace and mercy. It requires humility and sacrifices. Indeed, we suffer because we love you to the glory of God. And this is the heart of all Christian ministry. It's as if Paul is saying to us, you know, the first 40 years are the hardest. It's not about me. I'm fallen and frail and fragile and frightened, just like you are. But the Lord, whose mercy is new every morning, is always with me. He comforts me and he gently leads me so that I can face whatever challenges and trials the new day may bring. And this is God reliance. And God reliance rather than self reliance is what we need to encourage in one another, isn't it? We need a God reliant faith to be humble and prayerful and open and honest and patient and hardworking and joyful so that we can say, I get, docked, I get knocked down, but I get up again with God's help. This is how we persevere in Christian ministry and in the Christian life. But where do we begin? Well, starting in verse two, Paul spells out what this ministry looks like in practice. Essentially, it's a ministry of truth and light. So this is my second point for today. Unlike those false teachers who troubled the church with their deceptive and underhanded ways, Paul only trades in truth and light. So in verse two, this is what he says. Rather, we renounce secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Paul's life is marked by what I'm going to call a radical integrity. It is marked by truth and light. And you may choose to ignore Paul, but that would be a very foolish choice. Because with Paul, what you see is what you get. He only trades in truth and light. Again, he says in verse 2, we have renounced, and this is a strong word, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. Not so those false teachers. The false teachers are deceptive and their own hearts are filled with secret and shameful ways, or literally the hidden things of shame. 
In fact, they are living a lie and they ought to confess their sins to God. But instead, what do they do? They turn around and distort God's word in order to justify themselves and get around the obvious truth that is in the Bible. Think about that. And then even more shamefully, they try to get others to join them in their sins. So if you're a new Christian today, please take note of Paul's wise advice. Whatever church you attend, make sure the truth of the Bible is set forth plainly. And then the truth, if it's really true, will convict your conscience and win you heart, mind and soul. And this is what good ministers and healthy churches do. There are no clever tricks, no sleights of hand, no hidden fees to pay, no secret knowledge. Just the pure, unadulterated word of God set forth as plain as plain can be. And Paul's ministry then is a ministry of truth and light. And I trust that our ministry here at Burwood is too. But even though Paul's ministry is full of truth and light, he also knows that not everyone who hears the truth will receive it as it really is. And not everyone will be moved to turn back to God. And so as we come to verse three, he adds this. But even if the gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. For the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the glory of the, sorry, the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. I love the way Paul strings those parts together so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Wow. The tragedy, though, is how the minds of unbelievers have been blinded with that spiritual blindness. How has this happened? Well, we know it is because of our own sinfulness, but we also see the spiritual dimension of this because Satan is involved here. Satan is the God of this age and he rules the minds of many. This age is a shorthand way of talking about all the rubbish going on in our world today, all the opinions and theories and lies and deceptions that are opposed to God, the world living in rebellion to our creator. That is this present evil age. And Satan is the God of this age. There is a spiritual battle going on between the forces of light and darkness, and we are all involved in it. And you know it's true. Even though Christ has had the victory on the cross, yet we are caught in this now and not yet time between the victory on the cross and the final return of Jesus, when all these tensions will be resolved. We are in both ages as Christians, living in this world and living in Christ. And so we need to learn as Christians how to do that. It's not easy, is it? We are creatures of flesh, and yet we are born again by the Spirit of God. And we must live in this age, calling people to come and to meet Christ, who is Lord of the eternal age that is to come. So this is why no one ever comes to faith except by grace, the, God, the grace of God. Only when the Lord himself comes and rescues us from our own belief, removing that dark veil so that we can see the truth and then enlightening us with the light of the knowledge of the glory of Christ, only then do we finally see and believe. And who is Jesus? Well, we do, don't we? Jesus is the son of God. And Jesus is God the Son. He is not God the Father, nor is he God the Spirit, but he is God. Just as the Father is God and the Spirit is God, so the Son is God. But there is only one God, not three. That's the doctrine of the Trinity. And Jesus, we're told in verse 4, is the image of God. He makes God known to us in his character, in his works and his ways. This is the miracle of the incarnation. God become man, taking on human flesh and dwelling among us. It's one of the greatest miracles of all, because this is where the light of the gospel comes into the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. That's from John chapter 8, verse 12. And that is a verse to consider, isn't it? I am the light of the world. Who can say that? except Jesus, because he was there in the beginning, speaking creation into existence. 
And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Jesus is the light of the world. Whoever follows him will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So friends, do you want to see the light? Do you want to know the truth about life and death? Do you want to be rescued from the wretchedness of sin? Are you tired of living in the darkness? Then turn your life around and repent of your sins. Come out of that cave because Jesus is the light of the world and you need to look to him. Believe in him as Lord and God for his love is shining upon you now. What you need to then do is to follow him starting today. This is the miracle of salvation. Perhaps for you right now, it's the most important step you can take in your life. To turn around, to come to Jesus and to follow him. It's such a great work of grace that the Apostle Paul compares that moment of new birth to God's work of creation in Genesis chapter 1. Listen to this from verse 6. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, that's the Genesis bit, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But what a fantastic statement of the gospel this is. It tells us that the new birth, the, the birth, the beginning of a new Christian life is a moment of radical new creation. And it stands in importance with the original creation of the world. What a miracle it is when a person becomes a believer in Jesus. When you receive the light of the gospel, it's like day one of the rest of your life. You begin to shine for Jesus like light in the darkness. And as you walk with Jesus, God will use you in ways you would never have imagined possible. Like the Apostle Paul, you'll become a servant of the gospel for Jesus' sake. You'll see people being saved before your very eyes. You'll also see people being offended and upset. But either way, you'll see God's love at work in you and through you to bring glory to his name. It really is a great privilege and joy to be a Christian and to shine for Jesus. Having said that, though, there is a cost to all of this. And Paul makes it clear in the next section of our passage. This is my third point. I've called it treasure in jars of clay. I want you to look at verse 7. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. It's to God that the glory belongs for anything that is achieved and accomplished in our lives of permanence. I really love this verse because it speaks to me of my own experiences of the paradox to the Christian life, this living in two ages that I was talking about. On the one hand, when I look in the mirror in the morning, I see myself standing there. And I think, what happened to my dark hair? It's all turned grey. I, I can see that I'm just a cracked and crumbling container. I'm just a jar of clay. And to myself, I realise how worthless I am in the scheme of things. But I'm not worthless to God, am I? Like a cracked piece of pottery is picked me up off the scrap heap and made something beautiful of my life. In Christ, as a Christian, I know that this little jar of clay, meaning myself, I'm not empty. Because God has hidden his treasure in me, even the gospel of the Lord Jesus, and he has made something beautiful of my life. I have become precious, so precious precious to God, and my life is not without meaning. But it is a strange paradox, this miracle of the new birth, this life we live by faith in the Son of God, this glory and humility, this strength in weakness, but it's a true reflection of the life of Jesus, and so it should be. But then herein lies the cost. We must talk the whole truth of the gospel. There is a great blessing and benefit to be had but there is also a cost because the christian life is always shaped by the cross where jesus died jesus said to his disciples if the world hates you keep in mind that it hated me first we are to expect opposition if we represent jesus in the world this is unavoidable you can't have one without the other if you want to share in the life of Christ, you must also be prepared to participate in his death. If you want to live with Jesus, you must also die with Jesus. That's just how it works. That's why Christian ministry is so hard. 
So in verse eight, Paul shares something from his own personal experience. But I want you to notice as we read this, how he always puts the emphasis on the deliverance and not on the trial. This is not a grumble, although it could easily have been. No, he, he focuses on the deliverance and not on the trial. And this is important because it reminds us that God never abandons us in our trials. In fact, our willingness to persevere becomes a sign of his love and his presence with us as he works in us to bring glory to himself in the midst of our trials. So I want to read these verses now and I want you to listen carefully as we read it together, starting in verse 8. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. There's a lot in that verse, isn't there? We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So this is the treasure in jars of clay, isn't it? This message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the gospel that gives us new birth. And this is the great treasure that we have to be shared with those around us. I don't think I need to tell you that the Apostle Paul was often placed in extreme danger due to his love for Jesus and his care for the church. You can see again, we always carry around the death of Jesus, just like the cross on which our Saviour died. Paul is saying, I'm a cross bearer. I'm a cross bearer. And in his life, he suffers even to the point of death in order that he might show the power of the resurrection to those who want to hear about Jesus. And now at this point, I have to share with you an illustration from a sermon I heard when I was still a young Christian. As I remember, the preacher brought out an earthen jar that was cracked and broken and crazed with fractures. It was such a worthless looking thing. And he held it up and he spoke about all the hurts and disappointments of life, the failed exams, the friends who lied, the times of loneliness, the fractured friendships with other Christians and all the battles with sin and temptation. And he made the point that this fractured jar was a perfect picture of my life and his. And then it was in an evening service at night time. He had the lights in the church turned out and the whole church went dark. But instantly that jar of clay that appeared so common a moment before was transformed into something beautiful. For now the, the speaker had lit a candle and lifted it up inside the jar and the light began to spill out through all the holes and fractures in the jar in a most inspiring and unforgettable way. And it taught me that God is able to glorify himself in my life too, despite all my faults and failings. He glorifies himself, not because of I, who I am, but because of who he is. The glory of the Lord is, is magnified in my weakness. And so, as the apostle says in verse 11, we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is at work in us but life is at work in you. And this is the key, isn't it? It all comes back to God's love for us in Jesus Christ. The question is, though, are we prepared to live by faith in this Son of God? Are we prepared to take up our cross and follow him? If we are, it'll affect everything we do, from the words we speak to the clothes we wear to the places we go and to the treasure we seek. It's all about God's great love for us in Jesus Christ. This is why the Apostle Paul was willing to suffer so much hardship for the people at Corinth. He was willing to pay even the ultimate price if need be, if that's what it took to see the gospel formed in the lives of these people. He had a Christ-like ministry. But are we prepared to live by that same standard of faith today? I'm afraid that many of us are not. Look at verse 13, because I think this is really challenging. This is Paul's way of telling us that we need to grow a spine. Verse 13, it is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. And with that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present you with us 
in his presence. If you believe in the resurrection and you know it's true, then we need to talk about it with others. Too often it happens that Christians crumble in the face of adversity. But the Apostle Paul was determined to hold his ground. Let people say what they will, think what they will, do what they will. But as for me, I'd rather die than deny the truth. And so too, we must be prepared to speak the truth when we need to speak it. I don't mean to make trouble. I mean to defend the truth. It's about the love that we have for Christ and for one another. And Paul makes this clear in verse 15. He says, all this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Brothers and sisters, an example of how this might apply to us right now is the question of what to do about the government's plan to introduce vaccine passports. Because our challenge right now is to honour Christ and to love one another without dividing the church. Right now, the government is saying that when we open up in October, we'll not be allowed to have unvaccinated people come to church. But I think that's reprehensible. The gospel makes no such distinction. If anything, it does the exact opposite. And if the church chooses to make unvaccinated Christians unwelcome or raises barriers to their attendance or involvement in ministry, even for a time, then we must not overlook the fact that those people and others who view their treatment as unbiblical may never return to a church that treats them in that way. Now, this is really difficult, isn't it? I know there are some of us who are all in favour of vaccine passports, but it seems to me vaccine passports are a very blunt instrument and they're actually against the law of our own land because your medical details are yours alone to share. In fact, if you want to guard your medical details, I suggest you go to Mark Latham's Facebook page and he'll tell you how to obtain the necessary paperwork so that you don't have to provide your information about your personal health details. I also want you to know that I'm working right now with a group of people who are aiming to protect the consciences and freedoms and jobs of those who currently feel they are compelled to be vaccinated. And this is not to say that we shouldn't be vaccinated if it is right for us. I'm not a doctor, I can't tell you what to do, but I know this is an important pastoral matter. So please pray for us as we plan and prepare for a debate that we need to have for the good of the whole church. And finally, let us keep all these things in perspective. When you put the problems associated with COVID-19 into the scales of history, they can seem to be very weighty issues. And they are weighty up to a point, but they're nothing compared to the immeasurable weight of the glory of God. You put one in the scales and then you put the other, I tell you which way the scales are gonna turn. So my final point for today is called the weight of eternal glory. And it's a very helpful reminder to us of the things that really matter in this life. For example, having the courage to stand up for the truth without losing heart and loving one another in Christ, come what may, and keeping our eyes fixed on the eternal reality of heaven. There are some things that really do matter in this life. And I think it's time for us to come back to first principles as Paul urges us to do in verse 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. God is teaching us a lesson here <clears throat> on how to love one another. We are right now in the midst of a spiritual battle and Satan is trying to divide us. We mustn't let him do that. It's true, some may yet die from COVID-related complications. And in our church, there are doctors and nurses who have to treat the sick and the dying, not an easy job. It's also true that in our midst, there are those who will lose their jobs in coming days because they will not in conscience accept the way the government is going about these vaccination mandates. It's so hard, isn't it? But in all of this, I know that God wants us to love one another in Christ. Of this, I'm very sure. But to do that, we need to point each other back to God and keep working to get that right perspective on our troubles. So verse 18 says, so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Friends, there is great wisdom in these words. We must learn to put them into practice. 
You'll notice the Bible doesn't pretend that our problems are not there. It simply declares that there's more to see. We need to put our problems into the bigger picture, into the right perspective. And this is God's way, really, of bringing us to maturity in Christ, of stretching our wings, as it were, to prepare us for the glory of heaven. We're being called on to practice our faith. Did you know, by the way, that if you interrupt the birth of a butterfly by opening its cocoon, thinking to save it from its struggles, you'll actually end up crippling the butterfly. It's true. Take away the struggle and the butterfly won't be able to exercise properly in that process of coming out of its, uh, of its um, cocoon to, to pump out its wings. Without the struggle, the little butterfly will probably never be able to fly. In the same way, God has a good purpose in the sufferings we go through as Christians. And there is a mystery to this. I don't deny it. But Paul is in no doubt as to the end result. He says in verse 17, look again, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And this is the immovable truth that we must lay hold of today. Let us place our troubles in the scales of eternity and see that they are but grains of dust. Too often, we let the little things in life take the biggest place. But in doing so, we cause ourselves no end of worry. To reset the scales, we must repent of our false perspectives and wrong priorities. Instead of saying prayers in which we tell God how big our problems are and how urgently he needs to fix them for us, we ought to pray for God's help in telling our hearts and our problems how big our God is. For the scales of eternity are on our side in Christ. In conclusion, we've seen today that Christian ministry is hard work. Indeed, the Christian life is hard work, but it's, it's worth it. It's a labour of love. And there'll be times when you do need to suffer for the truth. But don't worry, because as Chapo says, the first 40 years are the hardest, or the first 50, or the first 60, until he calls us home to glory. And then after that comes that glorious joy of eternity. No more worries. First 40 years are the hardest. Yes, it's hard work to love one another, but it's worth it. It's worth it to be there at the moment of someone's new birth and to see God working in our lives and to marvel at how wonderfully God is able to glorify himself in us, despite the fact that we are mere jars of clay. And finally, I want you to remember to keep your present trials in their eternal perspective. Don't make your troubles seem bigger than they are. Jason Meyer has a, a book uh, called Don't Lose Heart. And he calls this struggle the fight for sight. I think that's a good little description of what our passage today is talking about. We need to, have, we need to keep on fighting for the proper sight or understanding of, of the challenges we face. He makes a very helpful observation. He says, we lose heart when we buy into the lie that our difficulties are bigger than God. And we lose the fight for sight when we fail to see God correctly, when perception and reality don't align properly, it's easy to become discouraged. Don't make your troubles seem bigger than they are. That's not to diminish them in their present state. We, we need to encourage and be there for one another, not diminishing the challenges we face. But we need to be careful not to make our troubles seem bigger than they are. So keep your present trials in their eternal perspective. And one final thought to end on for today from Matthew Henry. Our duty as Christians is always to keep heaven in our eye and earth under our feet. So may God bless you and keep you in his love now and always. Amen.